was going to say just a few words, but um, before, and then I heard Wenbin's excellent talk, which was, they were mainly sort of a critique of some of the problems of some of the other models. And he said uh, more eloquently than I could have done what, uh, uh, what I thought, what, you know, problems I, I had with some of the other things that had been suggested. And then I heard Pawan's talk just now, uh, and again, it was very similar. What I was going to say was very much um, similar to many of the points that he made. And so there was a lot of some similarity to that too. And then finally, I've just heard Yuri's talk, where again, there's some similarity. So um, uh, um, what I was originally going to do was sort of talk about ideas that um, Amy Levinson and I had had uh, a couple of years ago. In fact, we drafted a paper and so on, and then found a mistake. Um, and it's an interesting mistake. Uh, but since coming here, and uh, I've thought of a, a few more things. So uh, this will start off, I suppose, as in your, your language as not a, a post-diction or a pre-diction, but a retro-diction. Um, and, and then, uh, if what I have to say, which is not a mature thought by any means, but it sort of follows on from what Amy and I were doing, and you know, um, that may may turn out to be a contradiction uh, deserving extradiction, uh, if, if, uh, if it turns out to be wrong. But anyway, let, let me let me just sort of say uh, what it is, and it's motivated very much by this sort of thought that you know the the the, the FRBs come from. Um, uh, the magnetos uh, magnetospheres of magnetized neutron stars probably magnetize easily, um, and uh, they are um, uh, you know, guilt by association and so on, because that's really a coherent emission. And um, uh, they're um, uh, and, and the view, you know, the view is that they're rather efficient. There's not all this, these, these, uh, you know, gamma, as you know. Um, Radio astronomers are deeply sensitive people, and um, the faintest breeze or a slight change in temperature, and they get terribly excited and rush off papers to nature and so on. Whereas you hit a gamma ray astronomer about the frontal lobes with a two by four, they don't notice, and um, so they're deeply. Uh, and uh, and so and, and so you know, you, there's not much power and there's not much energy in these in in these FRBs, which is not a it's a compliment to a radio astronomer. <laughs> and um, uh, and uh, so trying to do this very efficiently in terms of the free energy available, rather than with a lot of wasteful, unseen gamma rays. And this is very much, I think, motivating things that, that Pawan said, and also, I think, implicitly what Yuri said. So I'm very much on board with, with that philosophy, even if it turns out to be wrong. Um, so the idea that was inspired, uh, as always, as ideas are, by metaphor a long some time ago, and the two met there were two metaphors. One is a tsunami, um, uh, which we know quite a lot about, uh, and the other is um, uh, uh, um, Indiana Jones and cracking the bullwhip and so on, uh, which actually turns out to be a much more interesting problem. Lots of un un underemployed cowhands write letters to um, physics, uh, Journal of Fluid Mechanics and so on, trying to explain this. So it's actually quite complicated, that one, but I think this is what I'm going to say better. But it's basically the idea that a, a relatively small disturbance, as Powan described, caused by a starquake or a flare on the surface of a neutron star, prob probably, but not necessarily, but probably linear to start off with, steepens. And something that has a wavelength maybe of 100 meters or so, which would be the sort of characteristic size, if I if I just do something like this, um, lambda of order 100 meters steepens to something with structure, say, around 10 centimeters, which is what, for the gratification of radio astronomers and so on. Um, so, uh, so you develop this structure in a steepening way, as in the tsunami and so on, which is a long wavelength, low amplitude disturbance, which becomes nonlinear with catastrophic effects and so on. So that's, that's the thought. <clears throat> and, and basically, the idea, if, let me just back up a little bit and say, in the regime here, unlike Yuri, where the inertia simply is unimportant and does not matter. So we're doing force-free electrodynamics. Uh, in an, in, a, in a, an SGR, you're, um, you, you know, you, you are, the, the point is to make that, they call that electromagnetic energy, into pair plasma, into gamma rays, and so on, with high efficiency. So not interested in that regime. We're interested in the other regime, 
when it's essentially just a, a force-free force wave, uh, force-free uh, force disturbance, and, uh, and in particular on an open field line where it's just going out and escaping all the other things that might be happening alongside it. So it's the first out, and it just goes along the open field lines. Nothing on the closed field lines. Things that go backwards and forwards on the closed field lines are likely to make pairs, but that's after the show, and you may or may not see them. Okay, so, so basically, let's, if you think about these waves, then in the simplest version, if you just take a linear wave like that, with some uh, wave vector like that, and it's well known. There are two modes. One of them I've called an electromagnetic or a fast mode, and it's just a, it's just an un, unchanged electromagnetic vacuum electromagnetic wave, no currents, no charges. That will just go straight out of there. Nothing happens. The other mode, as Yuri explained, uh, is is a, is an alpha or an intermediate mode, and that is one that um, requires currents and charges for in a for in a shear alpha wave for a, for an oblique wave. So it requires currents and charges. And again, you've got to ask, where, as, as power did, where do those come from? So let, let's consider this, perhaps, you know, as a disturbance. Now, as it goes outward down the declining magnetic field, its, relative, its amplitude will be, relative amplitude delta V over V will increase. And it'll become nonlinear, roughly, at a radius 10, 20, 30, or whatever, uh, uh, stellar radii, depending on what, you know, what, what the configuration of the energy is and so on. So it'll come at some significant distance from the surface of the star. It'll become nonlinear. And, um, and at that point, you could, so you then the question asks, well, what happens that, at that point? Um, and this is where the retroaddition comes in. What I thought, um, erroneously, was that the uh, energy, uh, the, 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 any sort of front would uh, increase uh, in proportion to the square. It would, get, it would increase on a cone, essentially, if it goes the, the, the square of radius. And I just implicitly thought that without thinking. Um, and, um, and if you do that and just make a very simple argument, the wave, in fact, does steepen. But what, term, what, is, what is, in fact, the case is that it expands along the flux surfaces. So that front will exp the area will go as R cubed. Under those circumstances, that wave, as I've just described it, does not steep, and, and the person who showed me, that explained this to me, was Yashi Yuan, who works here, um, and uh, she did some force calculations, and said, we're not seeing what you expected, because the wave is going out on these, kind of, and it was, you know, it's, you know and it, it, it's after the fact, it's obvious, so, so you know, so doing the simulation certainly uh, changed, changed my views on this. So, um, but then, the sort of thought that I've been thinking about a little bit here, and also very similar to what Pawan says, is um, you come to a point when you can no longer freshly create in the advancing front the electrons and positrons, the charges that you need to carry the currents and supply the charge density in this pulse. You can no longer do that. Close to the surface, the, the, vac the, the vacuum is essentially a perfect conductor. You can do this at will, but far enough out, you can't. And... So the, th the thought is basically the following. If, you, if we just sort of consider this, um, let's just, well, um, yeah, green fields are green. So let's do, do let's have, I'm not quite sure why that line is there. Let's start over here. Let's suppose that we've got some sort of disturbance like that. Um, and then say this is, these are magnetic fields, as I say, sort of like that. If he's a magnetic field, and it's going, going out. Um, this is an oblique wave. So if we do it in the frame of the pulse, which you can do, and this is just for a pulse going one way, I'm not interested in things going backwards and forwards, uh, then there's obviously some pointing. This is all, there's a pointing flux, an electric field upstream. There's a pointing flux that's going to be coming in towards the surface and across the surface, bringing electromagnetic energy in. And then you, you can figure out what's going on here, and this can be a stationary pulse and so on. And, and as long as... Uh, rho E plus J cross B equals zero. It's just a completely non-dissipative alpha in wave. Um, alpha, in uh, alpha in pulse, if you like. Um, so uh, this you can sort of describe in the frame with essentially this electromagnetic coming in. Now, now, if you want to say how is this going to evolve, if you think about it in the frame of the pulse, it's a relatively small thing. It's a sort of more or less adiabatic change, the first thing that happens is that the, these field lines ahead of the front slowly, slowly, slowly move apart, and so you can follow the energy that way, and this is just going, going down the, the magnetic gradient, 
and the, the wave will, uh, the, the pulse will, um, uh, will change as that happens. And as I say, that was the part I got wrong, but now I think I understand. And in fact, this picture makes it pretty clear why, why what I said was wrong. Um, and so it goes across like, uh, like that. But then the second thing, where I think there may be some action going on, um, is, uh, is the, um, uh, the what, 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 what Powell called the charge starvation radius, when you become, for this particular pulse, not in general, but in, for this particular pulse, no longer possible to make the charges, no longer possible to make electrons and positrons locally. Um, so in that case, you can sort of write down, you're going to develop essentially uh, an E along the magnetic field, E dot B not equal to zero, and that is what is ultimately responsible for making the, um, making the charges and sort of written down some sort of simple prescriptions for doing the, uh, for, for a sort of Lorentz invariant Ohm's law in that in local, in, locally in that environment, it may well be a non-local problem, but doing it in that environment. And uh, the sort of, where, where I'll just leave you with the following tantalizing thought, which is not something that is demonstrated. It may all turn out to be horribly wrong. But the thought is that this fr front here essentially moves at C. If you take, take the magnetic field ahead of the pulse and say the pulse is moving in that direction, some angle uh, theta to that direction of the magnetic field, you know, 45 degrees or something like that, then the characteristic speed is, is, is this is, is, is C cosine theta. So it's mark, you want to do Lorentz transformations and so on to get in the frame, but that's, that's, that's easy. Uh, so you do the Lorentz transformation to get into this frame, and then you write a Lorentz invariant prescription for uh, failing to make the current that you need to violating this condition, not with inertia, but with, uh, as, as I think somebody, one of the talks said, made it absolutely clear, uh, changing conduction current into displacement current. So it's that steady conversion. And the, and the thought is the following. This part in the middle, where this is going to happen is this bit in the middle. And this bit in the middle, there you're trying, you're, that's where you'll start making an electromagnetic wave out of an alpha wave wave. And that is uh, going to want to travel at the speed of light, whereas this up in front is traveling slower than the speed of light. So just like, you know, the waves that we know, like ocean waves that in the Riemann problem overturn and become, uh, uh, then, uh, uh, then, uh, there's a chance that that will be traveling faster than that and will steepen it up. And I don't know whether you can get from 100 meters to 10 centimeters, but if you can, you know, you've got some, some very sharp pulse. It goes out without too much, it's the elephant hitting the, uh, uh, the fly's nest, as you said, um, and uh, goes out of the magnetosphere and so on, and then encounters at some point plasma, which does the dispersion and will then spread it way out. So there are many ways, of course, this could, there are so many ways, some of which rehearsed, that, that this could be um, uh, falsified uh, by observation. Uh, and uh, obviously, if you can say that the original initial pulse has to be, say, milliseconds in length in these pulses, this one has to be something that's essentially a delta function. And then eventually it's going to be spread by all the propagation. So, you know, and, and obviously finding... Uh, gravitational waves or neutrinos or whatever alongside these things will we'll, we'll lose out. Anyway, that's that's what, that's, in, that's enough. Okay, so okay, there you go. Thanks again, Roger. And what we would like to do is uh, I post I I have posed some questions here, which unfortunately I think the panel is not able to quite see. Okay, um, but uh, you will answer. We will answer a different one. Yeah. But these are just. Just to get things started, the discussion, what I would really like to do is have questions from the audience for members of the panel. And, um, and I would like to make a, one suggestion, just one suggestion to the panel members. You all have got different ideas, and you have your own favorite model. For the next 42 minutes, may I just urge you to think a little bit outside of your own model, which I know are beautiful models. All of you are got beautiful model. If it is not realized by nature, well, that's her problem, not your problem. <laughs> so let's get that out of the way. OK? And for the next 42 minutes, let's keep an open mind to see what nature is doing. And I have posed here a number of questions. We can certainly. Uh, 
The first one, for instance, is something that Star Finney's panel, I'm, I wasn't here but dealt with, and I'm assuming Star, you have an answer. Is it a magnetar or not? But in, a, in, in any case, so that has been answered. Yes and no. It is yes and no. <laughs> okay, all right. all right. Okay, so that one we are not going to. Although the, the question of central engine and the radiation mechanism are not decoupled. One has the effect on the other, okay? But we are not, we are, that has been dispensed with, okay? So we are moving on. So there are all these different ideas that we heard this morning. Masers, plasma processes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, one question that I pose is, at what distance is the radiation being produced, assuming there's a compact object, Close to the compact object, far away from the compact object, we have, again, hard arguments for and against it, yeah? So, one, so I would like to suggest that each member of the panel, maybe just for 30 seconds to one minute, and restrict your answers to short, brief, sharp answers, one minute, um, to this question. And also, a, a related question is, is the radio channel the dominant channel for the energy that is coming out? Or is the energy coming out, most of the energy coming out in some other channel, okay? Non-radio channels, yeah, at high frequencies. So if I may have the members of the panel here, just go and say 30 seconds to a minute each, these two things, these two questions. So we don't know. You can just say, I don't know. That's fine. That's a totally fine and honest answer. So let's just start. I know you are, uh, you, you very much are part of the theory panel. <laughs> yeah, I uh, and so, and, but, you have, I'm. but you bring one thing that none of us do. You have observations. Yes? To, so let's just start, start with you, Virginia. Well, I think the clear answer is I don't know. Um, so, but I am hopeful. I personally, I just find magnetars very exciting. <laughs> so I think that is my guess for what they are, only because it's wishful thinking. Ali? Uh, so I, I, I would say that the <clears throat> probably a useful thing to do is to try and constrain observationally this, the f energy fraction in radio compared to other wave bands. I think that even in the most optimistic models, uh, only, let's say, very efficient mechanism, like 1% of the energy would come out in the radio. Uh, so some, some, somewhere between 100 times and 60 orders of magnitude, larger energy should come out in other wave bands. And I think this is one of the most important things to try and, uh, and constrain. You can certainly answer that question for your own favorite model. That's a totally fine thing to do, yeah? So that the audience here, and we have got good number of observers here in the audience, they get some sense of what the expectations are. I mean, that's what I'm hoping to, that they could carry with them. I mean, you know, they would carry with them that theorists are all confused, know nothing. I mean, maybe that's what, what it is. But so you can say about your model, for instance, what the expectations are. I don't have a favorite model, so, and I think it's not the right way to go. I think that okay. we have a large uncertainty between two and six orders of magnitude, and we try, need to try to constrain this ob observationally. Um, there's no point in betting on some. Uh, That's some fine. It's a tot totally fair, fair point. So, let's go. Oh yes, of course. Yes, thank you for reminding. So, um, Shasha is online, and let's yes, turn to Shasha. Shasha. Hello. We can hear you. Do you want me to answer? Can you please, if you could, if you heard. Uh, before I go, I want to comment about your second question about masers, plasma processes, antennas, and stuff. So I'm strongly in favor of plasma processes and re with respect to bunching. I think, you know, 50 years of pulsars uh, taught us something about bunches being not a nice model for coherent radio emission. Uh, with anything else, I'm very much uh, fine and in agreement with. All right, let's move. Anything else to add, Shasha, to that? Otherwise, we will move on to uh, Wen Wen Lu. Wen Wen. Oh, so, um, so I, 
again, I, I, I start from the observational point, which is uh, if you integrate over all the effort re repetitions from 12, 11, node 2, and average over time, it's a huge, there could be huge errors, but you get 10 to the 44 ergs roughly, if it, is, if it is not beamed, isotropy equivalent. So if you can compare that with some you know, total magnetic energy for a given magnetar, let's say 10 to the 15 Gauss, or it could be 10 to the 16 Gauss, which will make it more extreme. But it seems to me if magnetars are really the thing, then the efficiency is not very, very, very low. It cannot be 10 to minus six or <laughs> minus eight. So. So there, it, it depends. So I, so my, my answer to the question is that depending on whether we get counterparts or not, if the efficiency is indeed high, high, I, I mean by more than let's say one percent, then there is a hope to get to the bottom of the story. I think, if it is very low, ten to the minus four, ten to the minus five, I think it's hopeless to get to. I mean, within the decade or so, it's hopeless to get to the bottom of the story. That's uh, my. I don't. I don't. I don't bet on any of those. If it is this slow, where is the rest of the energy? Like I mean, that's the other wavelength. So it would, you know, it would be actually better in that sense that it would be brighter at other wavelengths. Yes, it would be better <laughs> to be able to say it. Yes. It but but the, the actual mechanism for reading emission it would never have been done in the real world. So that's a that's a tiny fraction of the total energy lifetime. But but it's Can you please use the from the first the talk, we, we already have some constraints on how much other energy there could have been, right? Not very constraining. That's not, yeah, that's right. At this point in time. But is this going to improve? Optically, yes, I think. At least. Yes, with optical, it could be improved. Once you have gamma rays. So by, by how much? So, like, what, what's the prediction? In the X-rays and gamma rays, it's, I think it's going to be a bit difficult. But in the optical, it could be yeah. much improved. Um, and I mean, we already know that in this, in the in the repeater that you mentioned, the energy in the in the that is emitted uh, on in the flares in radio is six orders of magnitude smaller than the energy that you have in the persistent uh, source emission. So we, we already know it's a, uh, the radio is sort of. Uh, so Roger. Ra ra Okay, um, so to answer your question, uh, I personally regard uh, 10 to the 40th brightness temperature uh, pulses coming from a solar mass worth of nuclear matter embedded with a, a, Schwinger mag a post, pre post Schwinger magnetic field, uh, elect magnetic field and electric fields as being the boring, conservative, and prosaic explanation. Uh, and, in, and I'm rooting for Chris Thompson or something like that. I would like to see something even more exciting than that being the explanation. Sure. Um, and so that, that's where I come from. And, uh, and I would have w make one more thing. When the next uh, tranche of transient event gets, as a class gets discovered, we call them after GRBs and FRBs, we call them ERBs. So first, I have to say that this format with one minute reminds me of the democratic debate. So uh, <coughs> I, I like it. It's only limited. I wish, I wish we, there was more. Time. No, no, no. I'm, it's, I'm joking. It's I'm joking. Limited I'm just by that I feel kind of like Bernie Sanders. Um, so so a, a couple of points that I just want to make. I think um, so. What I gather from this, uh, from our discussion this morning, is that. We, we all love uh, coherent emission processes, and, and regardless of everything else, this would be a very good excuse to understand more about coherent emission processes in astrophysics. Um, what uh, will have to be done carefully, uh, I think in any case, is the uh, <coughs> details of why this emission process uh, get to work, and it's persisting. For example, in the case of the charge bunches, do we actually, are we actually sure that there are no competing mechanisms once the charge starvation regime is achieved that will destroy the charge bunches uh, before they actually have the opportunity to radiate? So uh, I think especially the multidimensional physics of, of the process might, um, uh, might pose challenges or might open new avenues for investigation. I think the other point that I think is, is worth a serious consideration is that um, these are very strong waves uh, propagating in very, and I'm making this as a very general statement, these are very strong waves propagating in very exotic environments, um, and we really need to understand very well the propagation of these waves. Um, and that will potentially discriminate very seriously whether they're coming from 
very close to the uh, engine or further away, and whether this is actually a way to distinguish this, uh, these possible scenarios. Thank you. Well, uh, Lorenzo, the point of the charge clump survival is, of course, something that has been around. And uh, they will survive on a time scale of order of the light crossing time across the clump, which is something on the order of R over gamma. Just to clarify that point, but let's move on to Yuri. Okay. Uh, I would like to mention that, from my point of view, all this classification, uh, mother emission, plasma, and what else, antenna, is more or less the same. Because it's just different uh, language of, the, of description. Because what has been measured? People describe on quantum language that there is inverse population and so on. But we, need, we deal with classical systems. Therefore, all these systems are, in fact, uh, unstable plasma, some resonant stability, and uh, if wave with appropriate uh, resonant frequency enters, it is amplified. And then uh, uh, it is amplified uh, modulating plasma, and therefore bunches are formed which radiate these waves. Uh, uh, therefore, this is also antenna emission. There is no dif the, the difference is that in laser mechanism, bunches are formed naturally, uh, and uh, what is called antenna emission, bunches are formed by some other mechanism of band, or in many cases just by human, by insert of background. Hold the microphone closer so they can hear you on the internet. Okay, and this is the basic problem with what is called antenna mechanism because uh, this is just hand waving uh, argument how these uh, bunches are formed. And uh, my concern about all these uh, stories about uh, uh, curvature emission of bunches and so on, even taking apart all question how these bunches are formed, how they survive against huge repulsive potential. Uh, when people use uh, formulas from Jackson's textbook, it looks very suspicious because uh, they assume that this is a radiation vacuum. But if we, if we b b believe yeah. more <laughs> that the, if we believe that these bunches are created by little green, green men, this is okay. <laughs> they produce these uh, huge charges and send them. If you believe that this is produced in plasma, we know that plasma density is determined uh, by the condition that the number of particles per bunch, so plasma density should be large enough. Specifically for FRB, we need plasma density such that plasma frequency is orders of magnitude larger than the emitted frequency. And in this case, uh, Jackson's textbook uh, should be with all respect put apart. Because this is different radiation, it's radiation in plasma. Plasma shields uh, charge. And the first question should be answered, how charge, assuming that this charge is formed, radiates in this form. Let's uh, go to Anatoly and hear from Anatoly. And uh, let's also turn to audience. I think instead of kind of addressing, me addressing all of these questions, which are interesting questions, let's just follow and have everybody an opportunity <laughs> to right. answer and raise questions. So we do, I see that. Let's still, okay. let's just go so, so through let, let me just, Anatoly's uh, view. Um, talk a little bit about the coherent emission that we actually observe, uh, and we think we, un we should understand better, which is the one coming from pulsars. So uh, there has been some development in the last year uh, based on the ab initio simulations of uh, magnetospheres that people like Sasha Filippov are doing. Uh, so there seems to be two mechanisms that are creating uh, coherent radio emission from pulsars like the crab. So there is the polar emission, which we all know and love, but there are also things that, that we call giant pulses. And um, so the giant pulses seem to be in these uh, current ab initio models to uh, appear from beyond the uh, light cylinder. They seem to be coming from the current sheet uh, where, and they seem to also be coincident with gamma rays. Uh, in that region, what's causing them in the simulations is reconnection. So reconnection, uh, as was shown in, this, in several talks, creates these islands, and those are large conglomerations of charge, uh, and when they merge, that's a, a global perturbation to the electromagnetic field. And that, that's, you know, if you call, if you want to call it bunch, you could, but it's really just a change in current. So uh, two, 
two islands colliding. So if I wanted to bet, uh, I would bet on some sort of islands of currents colliding somewhere. I don't know where. Uh, it, from an uh, aesthetic point of view, it, I would I prefer being close to a neutron star uh, rather than very far away from it because it seems like you it's more under control. Like if you want to repeat it, it's right there. It's much easier to repeat. If you have to rely on something very far away, a lot of fine tuning just from a static point of view seems to uh, seems to be needed. Uh, another uh, radio emission that we know is the polar one, and this is where some advances have been made uh, recently. Uh, the traditional picture that there should be some, uh, as it punches on emitting curvature, we don't see that in simulations. What we do see is time-dependent gaps. So. Uh, there is an accelerating field close to the star. It accelerates particles. Uh, gamma rays are produced. Those gamma rays uh, create pairs, and they short out accelerating electric field. The way that shorting out happens is not one-dimensional. It's two-dimensional or more. Uh, and as a result, you have gradients in how you shield the plasma. And those gradients create, again, perturbations of the electromagnetic field. So we see uh, propagating O modes that are created in the base of this very dynamic gap. So this sort of relates to what Roger and, and Pond have been saying, that there are these strong time-dependent electric fields that, that are formed, for example, in further away in your model where the waves dissipate. Maybe it's related to what we're seeing in the gaps close to the star. Um, I'm not sure that's the mechanism we need for FRBs. If I wanted to bet, that would be more on the current sheet emission and plasmoids. Uh, but th that's, that's what I know f based on, you know, uh, radio pulses. And one, one comment I wanted to make about these alpha and waves and breaking of alpha and waves. Um, I, I thought about, well, this sounds like a cool idea. Should I simulate this? And then I thought about the following, that we kind of did simulate this before. If you want to create a very strong alpha and wave, uh, you know, you twist the star and it launches a huge alpha and wave. And that's what we do when we start rotating pulsars, right? When we start uh, uh, forming a pulsar magnetosphere, we, we spin it really strong. There is no uh, you know, just the polar field outside, strong alpha and wave propagates. What it does is when the field strength is strong, stronger compared to the background field, what it does is it just changes the magnetosphere. You, f you open the field lines, you ch reform the magnetosphere, you form a, a wind. And I'm afraid that's what's going to happen. When this magnetic field is going to become very large compared to the background field, instead of just deciding that it's giving up and creating, you know, just shorting out, it just will change the structure of the magnetosphere. And these alpha and waves carry charge with them. So I think they will just they will just open up, let this thing leave, and nothing nothing bad will happen. But this needs to be checked with the, with the simulation. So I'll stop. So le le uh, when Ben, you had your hand raised briefly, I saw. Uh, why don't you address, and then let's just turn to audience, because the time is, uh, is, is we have very limited amount of time, <laughs> and I, I, we should have a sample of questions from the audience. So, Ben, ben uh, briefly, whatever it is that you are going to address. Yeah, I want to address uh, Yuri's uh, 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 question on the plasma effects on the radiation. So, indeed, it's very important, but just for O mode. For X mode, as Roger is very clear, so for the X mode, the refraction index is exactly one when the B field is infinity. So near the surface of a neutron star, the X mode would just propagate as if in vacuum. There is not much of a plasma effect. But the O mode, I agree, uh, or the alpha wave, is strongly affected. That I agree. Yeah. Let's turn to the audience. Let's yeah. turn to the audience. Let's yeah. take, sorry, Roger. Roger, you were well, going to say something. Good thing he's going to ask it put a question on the table. Uh, in addition to simulation to explore the, what's going on here, is there any hope with um, you know, E-beams e in laboratory, in a place like Black and so on, where you've got undulators? Can you actually learn something from, I mean, there's a lot of physics that goes into those, but also maybe doing more stylized experiments that might e explore some of the effects of Renning and others with that? Let's turn to the audience. Let's take some, some <coughs> number of questions, and I would... Uh, I saw you first, uh, yeah, Ido Barger. The, the, so the question Ido. is related yeah. to the models where the efficiency is low and there is a order 10 to the 46 ergs of total energy. So if it's in gamma rays, I think that's kind of hopeless to see. Um, in the optical, do we expect, just to so I understand what's the time scale that's expected for the optical emission, is it comparable? Is it a millisecond time scale? It would be something of that. Uh, no, go ahead, Ali, go ahead. You, go ahead. I think in, the, in all these models, the, the time scales are comparable, but. Uh, you don't have to search for millisecond pulses in the optical. You, the, because even if you are integrating over a few seconds, you should still be able to see them quite far away. 
So just the total energy. I ran that number quickly. I mean, if you're integrating a typical integration in the, uh, these optical surveys like ZTF is something like 30 seconds or a minute, um, you smear out the signal enough that even at 100 megaparsecs, which is one of the nearest FRBs we have, um, you're down at the level of magnitude 21, which is at the very threshold of a survey like ZTF. So, again, I don't think it's trivial. It's probably easier than gamma rays, but it's not trivial with the surveys we have right now. We are going to come to, yes. Um, somewhat related question also for Ellie and others. Uh, so in the absence of, say, an optical flash or an X-ray uh, detection, is it useful to, to dig really deep in the luminosity function of a nearby repeating FRB? So if the energy budget in radio is, is dominated by microjansky bursts, which you can't see, but you see that it's still rising at millijansky bursts for fast or something. Um, is that informative or you don't have enough? Uh, I'm that does not answer, but I think yes. I think that uh, the best bet is to look for very for the nearest events or the brightest uh, oh. events, so that you can uh, ho have a reasonable chance of detecting the other uh, components. So we have okay. We have a number of questions also, which is being posted by, uh, you know, online questions. So if you want to turn around and answer, not you, just you, uh, Ali, but you know, other members of the no, 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 no. You can turn around. <laughs> You're welcome to turn around and move. Um, so anybody would like to to uh, address these questions? Yes. So, go ahead. Please go ahead. First one, yes. Highly uncertain, yes. That's what I thought. X-rays. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's what. Vicky, you had a question or a comment or something? It was, it was a comment and then a question, but it's not related to what's on the That's board. okay. Uh, so the first uh, comment, uh, first of all, um, I'm still reeling from Roger's comment yesterday about how the galactic magnetars are, quote, boring. And I am hoping that Nanda will school you in that uh, regard uh, later today. Uh, but nevertheless, I think what's important is uh, that, that none of the magnetars that we know of, uh, either from their emission properties um, or their location, all in the disk of a spiral galaxy, um, look like the magnetars that you're talking about. So I'm coming back to are they magnetars. And, and so I do feel that there is um, uh, a little bit of a, of a tooth fairy there that you, you have to... Um, uh, imagine a very special kind of magnetars. We always call them magnetars, but I always think of them, they're weird magnetars, number one. Number two, um, we know that some of these FRBs are in um, not young galaxies. We heard that from Ryan Shannon's talk, and so you need a, you know, that accretion-induced collapse to create a magnetar. Okay, that's another tooth fairy uh, right there. And that, so now I'm coming to my, my question. Now we also now know that at least one of these sources, and one of the ones that's er fairly early discovered, so you can dismiss it as an oddball, but um, it has periodic activity, and I haven't heard that today at all. And uh, so now you want a uh, weird magnetar created by accretion-induced collapse. Okay, not in that case, it's in a spiral galaxy, but nevertheless uh, orbiting in 16 days. So isn't that a third tooth fairy, and, and how many are we allowed um, before? So I'm rooting for Chris Thompson also, Roger, in that regard. <laughs> so very, very, yeah, very interesting sets of points here, Brian.
probably talk about this afternoon. I mean, it's not true that there aren't any stars forming in, in old galaxies. So I think, you know, if we have a few, if we start getting many, that's going to be a, an issue. Um, but, but it could be also there's young populations. I would also say, you know, just to go back to Andre's talk, we think that magnetars, when they're born, could be very, very different properties. Uh, Jin, who's wrote this question up here, has worked on, you know, arguing that if you have very strong magnetic fields at birth, that the rate of magnetic flux out of the core is controlled by amber polar diffusion and could be much faster. So they could be flaring it. Principle, you know, magnetars, even stronger magnetic fields than the galactic ones could be flaring at a much higher rate. So I think, we, anyways, I think theoretically we have some expectation that there, that there could be diversity. So um, I don't, I mean, I don't know if that's, it was, it w the paper was before the event, so I call it a prediction, but, but yeah. Um, two thirds. Yeah, so okay, anyways, there's a, I forget, what was the third two thirds, anyways. <laughs> so there is, the third one was, I think, very interesting uh, chime the jar of 16 day periodicity. So that's something that, so, so the panel, would anybody on the panel like to take up that question? Periodicity. <laughs> so, so there is a, there is a chime claim of 16 day periodicity for one of the repeaters. Um, is based on, uh, sorry, there's a huge jitter. It is a quarter of a phase. So, yes. So, so that could be one way out of it. Sure. Anybody? Yeah, is this predicted? Uh, has it been? Has that period been predicted? Yes. Most of the sets, no, 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 we think there's some ev quasi evidence. Oh, oh. So that would be well, definitely well, worth, well, worth, you know, will give more, more confidence. Yes. But the good news yes. star is that they will have more outburst from the source. No, no, and so we will know. It's just a, it's a question of time. You know, whenever it may be a month, maybe two months, but we will know the answer to that one. So that will get settled. Um, looking at the time, looking at the... Most pulsars are, are not in binaries. Your it's like 2%. Two percent. I think that, um, I mean, it could be an oddball, but if there were, you, if they were all in binary systems, is that, isn't that a little odd? It has to be in a dirty binary. In okay, order let's, to let's, we, to we, should, we should have a number of other points of views, questions raised. Bing, Bing Zong, you have been very patient. You had a, you had a question or comment. Yeah, uh, first, first, uh, go back to <coughs> what Wiki just said. So, oddball, so for this guy, uh, what, why we think it's oddball, we only have like one case that really monitor this long. So maybe uh, it's not the oddball. So well, it's 12, 11, 02 has been monitored for much longer. But and, uh, they and people have looked for, for periodicity. Uh, search for period for such a long uh, period, right? So uh, anybody? Yes. Uh, please go ahead. Yes, yes. The periodicity that you look for is the rotational periodicity between the worlds. I know, yes. try and have a lot more repeaters, so maybe you guys can find more, but I don't know. So. so, Jason, you had a question so, or a comment. Oh, uh, you have a follow-up, quick, quick follow-up. No, no, I actually have separate question, but separate if, question? if this is uh, related, maybe, maybe go on. So I have go ahead and too. ask your question, and then we'll go to Jason. 
question actually to the panel, to the Anatolians. So it's a very, very different question. Well, if it is very specialized and not of general interest to the audience, then I suggest discussing it over lunch or tea, if you think, and I'm going to just. But, but just can I preempt, prevent, uh, preempt your question? Uh, so th 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 <laughs> there, are, there are pulsars with planets, right? And as you probably, there are also asteroids. But so, so what's wrong with that? Just you know, add epicycles to the previously incomplete models, and you're done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. All right. What, what's wrong with yeah. that? Yes, Ellie. Can we also suggest? Well, there were other <laughs> other questions and topics, but I think we have turned to the audience, and we are just taking kind of broadly now to anything that we have got. Jason, you have got something. <laughs> Yeah, so I just wanted to ask the panel uh, about their thoughts about the, the, the drifting subbursts to lower frequencies, sometimes known as apparently the sad trombone uh, effect. Uh, um, I think that's really, really diagnostic. Of course, there's analogies with, with solar bursts as well. And I don't, I was expecting to hear more about that today because it really is quite different than what we see in pulsars. And it's quite obvious that it's, it's quite characteristic. So a certain of number of papers have been written, number of people, well, I don't know about the panel, but you know, Brian, you have worked on it. Lorenzo, wherever you are. Oh, Lorenzo, you have worked. So you want to take that up? L Lorenzo, you want to take that up? I think you, you already summarized it well. So, um, I mean, with, at least within any shock dominated scenario where the shock is sweeping up the external medium, you would naturally expect a drift of the spectrum just because the plasma conditions are changing over time. With really discrete, almost regularly sca uh, spaced gaps between the subbursts. Uh, well, that will... And also the drift changes with frequency, observing frequency as well. Uh, in that a systematic will, way. Th that will have to be quantified better. Um, it will naturally depend on the intrinsic synchron maser spectrum in the case of the synchron maser operating at the shock. Because as I said, the um, frequency structure intrinsic to the generated spectrum as well will impart uh, drifts uh, in the observing band uh, that are just dependent on the on the fact that the spectrum is not a broad broadband spectrum, but it will have like line-like features that will just sweep through, and potentially there will be a a gap because there are just two lines. The first line sweeps through, and then you don't see anything, and then the second line comes in the observing band, and you're seeing it. So. Um, Anything generic that could be uh, assessed in terms of like these gaps uh, on the observational grounds will be useful to see whether there is a preferred uh, plasma condition such that the spectrum is most likely to induce those gaps. Um, but I think the generic statement about the fact that any blast wave will be producing emission to lower and lower frequencies with time and so producing the drift, I, I think that, that's fair to say. Comment briefly on the on the, the, the frequency drifted. Sorry, uh, the drifted at different frequency. So the picture is you have a blast wave that starts off at some t equals zero, and everything's evolving at the power law time with respect to that. And so uh, you know, so so the two predictions of that are that the drifting rate will. So basically, the the burst will actually be longer at lower frequencies because it's going out to, to larger radii, uh, and that the drifting rate, say it's a power law. I think the drifting rate goes down. To lower frequency, we, we can talk about it. But there's a prediction <laughs> because because you're saying that the that the thing is sweeping as a power law in time relative to some you know flare, then that predicts a, 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 that the duration that the sweeping rate will become lower at lower frequencies. So, so uh, but uh, Tandulkar and then Starfini. So uh, I had a question about uh, so I, I was briefly discussing this with Brian earlier. Uh, can this so uh, the pick simulation seem to be fairly advanced? Can you actually forward model a complete uh, what an FRB would look like at the end of uh, uh, this thing? Because I think the deviation from a frequency to the minus two dispersion measure is very can very sensitively be measured by us. So the fact that we can we don't see deviations from frequency to the minus two is I think very uh, discriminating for this model. sure I'm entirely capturing. I mean, this Newton minus two is also coming from propagation effects that have to do with the, not just the place where the emission is generated, but the potentially propagation Absolutely. in the supernova ejecta, the surrounding uh, host galaxy. Um, I mean, are, are you? 
So uh, the if, if there is a new to the minus two uh, dispersion, right? Uh, all of that is additive and that can be corrected. But if you have something different from a new to the minus two, so where, where you have a wind or a constant density profile, if you get a power law which is different, that can sensitively be measured. That any deviation from a new to the minus two can be sensitively measured and it can constrain the K factor uh, in your density profiles. Yeah, but uh, I. But deviation from the new to minus two has to do with like omega equal to the plasma frequency, right? Mm -hmm. If you're close yeah. to that limit, then you're expecting deviation from the uh, cold plasma dispersion relation. Um, so, I mean, in that sense, yes, uh, but not in the sense that you're probing the medium. I mean, any density you have outside, mm -hmm. if omega is sufficiently far above the plasma frequency, will be. Um, Will 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 be giving you the new to the minus two, as like vanilla. Uh, uh, yeah. So let's yeah. go to Star. Okay. Star. Great. Let's have the panel address that, Roger. Um, as they say in theological circles, there are sins of emission and sins of transmission, and I'll vote for the, the second here. Second one, yeah. Uh, I think that uh, there, are, there are modes where you can get away from quasi-linear propagation in the rather strong field extreme environments that you have around these sources, whatever they are. And, you know, and the, I'm not sure how prevalent the circular polarization is. Somebody... I know there's a 130% case, of, but I don't know how common it is beyond that. But I would say that's not, not a, um, going to rule out too many of these observations, of these models in practice would be my guess. Yeah, I think that's right. Because one of the problems is that the new propagation is one thing that seems really hard to avoid having linear polarization. Yeah, that's yeah. correct. And yes. So I guess my question was whether does everybody agree that Propagation is the only way to get circular, or are there other ways? Well, uh, I mean, as a talk, it didn't seem like the wind should. Uh, I, I, I would have thought they had other options. I, uh, I think that uh, well, I'm not trying to advocate uh, a model, but uh, in the weakly magnetized case, uh, you do get quite different growth rates for different uh, for right-handed and left-handed uh, circular, uh, circular polarization. So in principle. You could get strong circular polarization in the weakly magnetized. Uh, Since we have a number of observers here, how, what, what, how many cases are there where you are confident that we have that you uh, that you are seeing circular polarization? Yes. We have only a, a few minutes left, really. And I would like to just pose a question to the panel. Um, what are the observational, what kind of observations is needed to be able to un understand the FRB emission mechanism? What do we need? You, theorists. Well, Multi-wavelength and multi-messenger especially and in the spirit of falsifying some of these models, I think. I think that's the, that I think is where I guess, you know, we're going to get the next meeting is going to have people to talk about this. Other views? Other point of views? Maybe the Yuri? Very important view is duration, true duration of, of the plasma. Before scattering to all, all the... So that is corrected far, and if you look at many of these papers, they correct for the uh, IGM and IASM scattering broadening. And, and uh, for many of these cases, that's not, that is, the broadening is a small. Observers can correct me. Well, you need to uh, be very careful with that as well, because some of the profiles have uh, frequency dependent 
shapes that you can fit out a scatter. Some of them do, but the question is that there are also cases where you don't see lambda to the power minus four or 4.4 broadening. Yeah. Yes? I think very little is known observationally about the lower limit on intrinsic yeah. widths. So when, when we dump voltages and we clear the DBS first, we see 10, 20 microsecond structure, but that was, that was an FRB detected with a millisecond backend. So we don't we don't know if there are twenty five nanosecond FRBs, and we should. Well, well but are you defining it as FRB or are you including it in? Yeah, I would say my, I would include microstructure. Yeah, I would include microstructure. Uh, what? No, there there are examples of very narrow individual. What would help me is to know which ambulance to chase uh, because observers really like their unique objects and theorists like a spherical cow object. So if you could tell us what's, what's normal and what's outlier, that would be really, really useful. On that note, should we thank the panel? We have used up the time and it's lunchtime, so we should wrap things up. Let's thank the panel members.